Hey, I'm Jude Madelich Hall, and this is Titles, Talk, and Tipples. My guest today is Teal James Glenn, author of the Dr. Shadows series, the John Shadows series, the Clockwork series, and the Cowboy in Carpathia. Welcome, Teal. <laughs> Welcome, Jude. What are we drinking tonight? I have lovely sweet tea, which yes. I like, nice chilled sweet tea. Mm-hmm. It's just enough caffeine to keep me going. And a little sugar and, you know, because I try not to drink carbonated stuff at home. Yeah. It's a bad habit. Yeah, I don't like um, carbonated stuff either. But, um, yes, I'm drinking the same thing. And so cheers. Clink. Cheers. Skull. Skull. <laughs> skull. <laughs> skull. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're just going to launch into this. We're um, talking about writing in different genres. And so you're big on that. I've written horror. I've written Westerns. I've written horror Westerns, mystery, uh, science fiction, sword and sorcery, detective, uh, and uh, occult detective stuff. Mm -hmm. Steampunk. Uh, Steampunk, uh, alternate history. Uh, You know, because to me... um, like I clockwork nutcracker I was writing it because the characters and the setting fascinated me and then someone pointed out oh you know that steampunk I went well, that's right Ooh. I didn't think of that because I, I always start with the character mm-hmm. and, and then the circumstance starts to build around that so um in theory any one of my characters could conceivably work in any other world you know I've written like realistic thrillers that are very grounded real world. But, you know, my fantasy stuff still has to have the same grounding in, in character. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It still has to be real. You know, it's just, uh, is this person an expert shot or is this person an expert crossbowman? Mm-hmm. Uh, and why are they expert? Well, then, then we go into their background. So it's still yeah. all about the characters. Uh, yes. And, you know, I appreciate that when I'm reading. Um, for me, like, Um, I like the subtleties of the universe, like convince me of the universe, whether it's steampunk, Western or what. Um, Don't don't make it too prominent. Don't describe it too much. Don't give me too much, because then I feel like you're trying to control where my brain is going. I love characters. I love the story. Yeah, I had had an editor years ago reading one of my sword and sorcery stories, and they said, I don't like sword and sorcery, but I really like your stories because the characters I went. There you go. I've done my job. I mean, they're very real to me, obviously. I mean, I, you know, often we'll talk about Altiva is my fantasy world. And if I'm feeling down, I always go, I want to go to Altiva today. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But it's it's the characters in that world that matter. And, um, you know, the rules of physics, as long as they're consistent in the world, it's still the real world to them. Yeah. Oh, yes. I often don't think about genre when I'm starting a story. Yeah. And sometimes I'll be into it. Like I said, with Nut- Clockwork Nutcracker, um, I was partway into it. And a friend who read some of it went, this is steampunk. And I went, oh, yeah, I guess it is. Yeah. That's I, really I interesting. Yeah. I didn't even consider that because it, it was it was alternate. It, it was alternate um, 1920s Europe. But I mean, the, con- the, the conceit of the story was I wanted to use the original Hoffman um, Nutcracker story uh, as the frame and then build a realistic adventure about it. That's very um, cool. <laughs> so, you know, Drosselmeyer is the, old, is the old alchemist, but his young nephew is the hero. And he goes up against Ratlochen, which is, you know, the rat lord. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and then it started to really build and I ended up building a world and I've written a bunch of different stories in the world yeah. and it just wasn't, you know, it was the conceit of doing the story that got me, not the world necessarily. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I also, I know people who are very big on, they do so much world building that they, they feel like they have to like throw it at you. Yeah. And, and I, I'm like, I only do as much world building as is necessary for the story. And mm-hmm. so sometimes I'll get to a new story or further in the story and discover another part of the world I hadn't thought about. Now I may have to go back and revise a little bit. Usually it's not. It's I'm just, you know, it's sort of there because when you write, say, um, if you're writing a story about someone taking a bus somewhere Mm -hmm. in our world, 
you don't describe everything. If it's oh, a right. specific feature, like if it's a bus going past Madison Square Garden, then it's significant to mention that maybe if they're from out of town or whatever. Mm-hmm. If not, it's just, yeah, I took the bus past the garden and went to the, and, and I try to have that same attitude in, you know, in a world where, you know, creatures exist. Well, they know the creatures exist, so it's not a big deal. Right. You know? <laughs> yeah. and, I can, I can know, see that. <laughs> you know, so it, it, it it's a, a delicate balance. I, I, I hate info dumps. And <laughs> yeah. Particularly when you're doing non-real, non-our world stories, info dumps are a real danger for mm-hmm. a writer. So, I made, uh, I made this, I made the mistake of info dumps. Like <laughs> I described yeah. like my whole city. It took me like, I don't know, maybe three pages of just describing the city and and I finally had one person that was like, this is a huge info dump. You need to spread this out. And exactly. in my brain, it was like, well, you know, it's, it was kind of awkward at first, um, suddenly bringing in this description of the street. But, you know, I got the hang of it. You know, um, yeah, I, I, you yeah, get the I, hang of it. It, it works. My, you know, my first draft will often be, I, I'm writing a story contempt- right now that takes place in Shanghai in 1937. And so... I, I did a lot of research on it, but um, if they're going from this place to that place, my first draft might describe a lot of stuff, but in my second graph, uh, draft, I'll go, well, they, we don't need to know that, or that fact can wait till there. And, I, and like you say, I will spread it out or include it in conversation sure. or yeah. you know, make it a throwaway, and then suddenly it feels more real. It's mm-hmm. like less is more. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And somebody described a cowboy in Carpathia. Um, they compared it. It was uh, a little bit like the travel log and the James Bond stories. It really puts you in the place. And I thought, all right, I'll take that. Because he, he, would, he would give you very real descriptions of things so he could do absurd stuff. And it would kind of blend in. You would try to accept it because he'd been so real with his description of the creme brulee or whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, and so, yeah, my descriptions of Cairo are very specific because then he's going to go and fight a mummy. So let yeah. me, let me ground you here and then I'll take you off on a flight of fancy. Oh, you know? that's great. I, I'm looking forward to reading that. That's probably <laughs> be my first book I read by you. <laughs> so. It is. It is, um, it really was a labor of love. Uh, it, as I said, and, and I will hold it up. This is my commercial moment. Oh, yes, please uh, do. Of, uh, I love that. Um, Robert E. Howard was the man who uh, created Conan. He basically invented Sword and Sorcery, but he wrote a lot of other characters. Um, uh, El Barak, um, uh, Tulak O'Brien, Bron McMorn, uh, Solomon Kane. But he did tremendous energy in his work. But as an individual, he didn't start selling until he was around 20 and he committed suicide when he was 30. Mm. He had a very short professional yeah. life. Yeah. And, um, and yet they're still finding manuscripts by him. He just created so much stuff. Oh my gosh. That's... So much energy. But he also, he never left about a hundred miles from the, the dirt water town that he grew up in, in Texas. Mm. Everything, all of his travels in the world were literally through books. And um, he was probably making the highest salary of anybody in the town. And they didn't know what to make of him because nobody made money writing. And he was just this weird guy, you know, and, and his stuff has so much energy. So the conceit of the book is that he doesn't commit suicide. Hmm. At the moment he's going to commit suicide, he chooses to live. And then he goes on to have adventures. And in the first one, he meets Dracula. Uh, and um, uh, which is why it's a cowboy in Carpathia. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and so I got the chance to go to all these places in, you know, literature uh, and in my head. Um, and because somebody, you know, I've done a lot of film work and people say, why don't you write more stuff in the film industry? I said, I've been there. Mm-hmm. I have a I have a series of husband and wife set in the 1930s, but it's in you know it's in Hollywood in the film industry, so it's not exactly where I am. I don't have you know written right. too much contemporary stuff, um, <laughs> and 
because I really enjoy the, the, the investigation and the exploration of the stuff, mm -hmm. create the world. Yes. You know? um, so, um, but yeah, in terms of genre, I'm always, for me, it's, it always starts with character. Yeah. Sometimes I'll have a character in my head before I have a story or before I even have a genre. Mm -hmm. I will see this character that will come fully formed and I'll go, okay, where do you want to go? You know, <laughs> and then I, I, I consider, I pretty much just write, write down, I, you know, they, they run around doing stuff and I just write down what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just their biographer. There you go. <laughs> you know, so um, it, um, and sometimes I write the book because I want to know what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, that's 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 a huge part of writing is um, you don't always get to go where you thought you were going to go. Your characters will definitely decide where they're going to go, what they're going to say. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. I, have, uh, I have a book coming out called The Final Escape, and um, it's about a guy who's an escape artist. Um, and um, it's a it's a thriller and um there was a character in it who was supposed to be a girl he picks up as a one night stand it was to show how he doesn't connect with people mm -hmm. and before the end of the chapter with her i realized she wasn't going to leave <laughs> <laughs> she's like nope <laughs> she, she's, she's gonna be in this story and so she became a major character i had to completely reconceive the rest of the novel and it was still about how he doesn't connect and of course how he has to connect mm -hmm. with you. But I'm like, she's just not going away. <laughs> just leave. Uh, and um, I don't know if that's a metaphor for life or what, but <laughs> okay. it, was, it was, you know, it's the first instance I've had where a character just said, no, I'm yeah. going yeah. I'm, over there. I'm going over here. You can follow, or you can leave, you know, yeah. and I just follow. Um, That's great. Yeah, I had a character um, and it, uh, it, w in my first novel is coming out like next week. And uh, what uh, that novel? Oh, the Everstein Chronicles, um, book one. <laughs> so it's been advertised with a subtitle, but at the last minute, we've decided to take the subtitle away. So it's just the first book is the Everstein Chronicles. Book cool. one, very simple. Because I, it was under that subtitle forever, six, six mm -hmm. years of being under that title. So, um, but I, I changed it. At yeah, so it's very interesting making such a. Well, it's not it, actually. It's not really that big of a change, but it feels like a big change to me. Of like, oh my I, god, I changed the title. It, it's been called this for so long. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, we say on stage, you know, if you don't yell, oops, the audience doesn't know you did the di a, a misstep, uh -huh. you know, because you've been rehearsing that other step forever. Yes, yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they don't know. She now <laughs> have to kill everyone who's seen this. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, it started this. It started small demons, the Everstein Chronicles. Then it was the Everstein Chronicles, small demons. <laughs> Now it's just the Everstein <laughs> Chronicles, <laughs> which I think, you know, I was a little sad, but I, I feel it was a really great decision because it is meant to be a series. And so this it's also it, it's actually because they, sometimes they'll say the mystery is better if you're not defining it by demons. You, you mm -hmm. make a larger audience. Right. And not, that's you're not going into it looking for demons. Yeah, that's exactly what my publisher said. And <laughs> I was like, OK, I trust you. <laughs> I don't know how to go about all this. I just want to write. Sometimes with movie posters, you look at a movie poster, that looks interesting, but I'm not quite sure what it's about. Mm -hmm. right. Now, they call that the lean in, you know, they want yeah. you to lean in and look at it a little bit more. So, uh -huh. cool. That's cool. Um, yeah. Uh, I, mean, so cool. I'm, I tend to come up with, a, I, I, I'm very tired. I have a friend actually who, like, will call me up and go, here's the story. Give me a title. Um, ah. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, I see stuff in bullet points like that. Um, oh, cool. But there's sometimes that I will, I will dance around and go, do I move this here? Well, uh, the book coming out is Semper Occultus. The second book, I was playing with two different titles. And so now it'll be Semper Fortis. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I, you know, I, I will look at the title and I'll stare at it and go, well, just saying what I wanted to say. And, yeah. um, and does it bring them, where I want them to go. I mean, Killing Shadows says, okay, this is some sort of adventure thing. Sure, yeah. I mean, A Cowboy in Carpathia 
is a little vague, but then it's got a vampire on the cover. Yeah, sure. It is. <laughs> <laughs> um, the second book is called The Cowboy and the Conqueror. Mm. And, um, but I'm, the, the assumption uh, about Howard Adventure. Yeah. So the assumption would be, well, they kind of have a little bit of a lean in already, so they'll, they'll follow it out. Yeah, sure. Um, and it but, probably has some sort of fantastical aspect of it, based not based on the title, but based on your first book. Yeah, exactly. You know, exactly. So. And much bigger, bigger and better baddie. Um, yeah. Yog Sagoth, uh, one of the Cthulhu monsters. Um, but it's the, the idea is well, when I, when I, when I first came up with the story, um, I, I didn't, um, the original title, it was actually a short story originally. And I, I wrote it with him and went, this is, I, I want to do more with this, yeah. but it was originally, a, um, uh, the crusader from cross plains. Hmm. And, uh, cause that's where he grew up in cross plains, Texas. And, I, and but when it became a, a book and then when I realized it was going to be a series, uh, cause that actually the second book I wrote first. And then I said, no, I got to write the book that comes before this. I went, I've got to come up with a title that feels like a series that, that has a common element that builds on that common element. So it's the cowboy end or a cowboy end. And as I go further, you know, cause I do hope to do more of them with him. There's a, a whole wide world out there to explore. Yes. <laughs> it sounds like it. There's, so many things you can do with that. Well, I have I have a fantasy series. I'm going to take off my hat here for a moment. So it's hot. I turned off the air conditioner not to be. Yeah, ready. this is a wool <laughs> pea coat, and I'm like, yeah, it's way too hot. But it's like I needed uh, a, I need a get cool broad here. shoulders and a <laughs> and a collar. But the <laughs> uh, but the the, this, the fantasy series, um, it's oddly enough, it's the Chronicles of Altiva, um, and. Um, I've got five books in it that are written, um, but um, I was playing for a long time about trying to give them all exactly the same follow-up title, and I realized that was nuts. Yeah, it's you know, I was different. So mm -hmm. it'll it'll be Chronicles of Altiva, and then it'll be you know, uh, Journey to Stormrest, Battle for Stormrest, and, and those. So like the subtitle will be the title of that book, but mm -hmm. I realized that there was just no way because. Um, some of them uh, in the different books, they, they concentrate on different main characters. Mm -hmm. you know, it, there's not all the same. And so if I were to do a title that was built on that one character, then the second book would make no sense. or the third book would make no sense. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the title matters. People mm -hmm. think it doesn't. And just oh, like gosh, the, yeah. matters, the title matters because you really, you know, at some point when your name is more that matters more than the title, They'll just put Stephen King and then it can be his laundry list or whatever you want. But his name is up here. Yeah. You know? It's going to be a long time before I reach that point, you know? So uh, we try. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it is really interesting um, that I, I struggle with titles sometimes. I mean, every once in a great while, a title will just be obvious, but, but I, uh, I've gone around and around and um, but, but talking about like a series um, each book following different characters uh, that's kind of where I'm ending up because of the, uh, the journey that I'm taking. My plan was to write a trilogy and then do offshoots from there. But my publisher talked me into go ahead, go ahead and jump into one of those offshoots now you know, with your uh -huh. second novel because my first novel is a fant fantasy satire, um, kind of gothic fantasy satire, steampunk. You know, it's it's kind of got all those elements. Yeah, well, uh, yeah it's tough when that when there's there's texturing and layering in the story yeah. to find the exact title that doesn't. Oh gosh, yeah, yeah. You don't want to sell it as a vampire story if it's not really a vampire story, even though right. there might be a character who is a vampire somewhere in it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And then that was, that was one thing is like, um, I kept calling it steampunk, steampunk, steampunk. And I had some people read it and they're like, you know, if, if I'd heard you say steampunk before I actually, uh, went talking about my beta readers, um, no. if, if you had told me it was steampunk when I first picked it up, I would not have read it because I'm not into steampunk. So it's not, you know, it's, it's not like in stone, it, it has steampunk elements, but it's not a full-on yeah. steampunk well, novel, you know. The thing is, even these days, steampunk 
some people say it's, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of been done. So it's sure. fading out, but there are other, there's gaslight fantasy mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, and Lock so work fantasy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Been, some of the categories are really just for the people putting it on a shelf. Yeah. Not yeah. Necessarily for the reader. So if, if you have a book that can be sold in a couple of different ways, then it's sort of up to the marketing people later on to go, okay, we'll market it as steampunk here, but in six months when the second book comes out, we'll push it, we'll push them both as gaslight fantasies or, yeah. uh, <laughs> and then move it in different directions. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, 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 titles are tough. I have, I, I tend to favor the old school convention. I like to name my chapters. And yeah, I, usually, I do too. I name my yeah, chapters yeah. usually ironically. <laughs> so that when you read the chapter, it might have something to do with the chapter, but it might be the exact counterpoint. So you're never mm. quite sure. But for my novels, that's one thing. One of my publishers does not like chapters on anything other than a full novel. If I set, turn in a novella, like the, the second John Shadows, uh, this is Killing Shadows, the first one. The second is actually two novellas. <clears throat> and um, and they actually take place just before this. But um, And I had chapter titles on them because to me, I just write them with chapter titles. And he went, no, we don't do that. And, oh. I, and I had to think, well, does it change the dynamic of the story? You yeah. know, and um, because I, I kind of built in in my head that my chapter title is some kind of either a tip off or an ironic thing. And um, I always remember that Ambrose Bierce, in that damn thing, which is one of his fantasy stories, the science fiction story early on, mm -hmm. that there's this creature that's invisible. It, it's one of the spectrum of light that we don't see, which at the time was remarkable, you know, the 1800s, yeah. early 1800s. But one of the chapter titles is, all that is on the table is not eaten. And then you read the chapter and the chapter is an autopsy. <sighs> and- Oh, that's great. And, you realize oh you're talking about the body on the table. Oh, that's, oh, I just, I love and that I, kind of stuff. <laughs> I read that and really? I went, I like that. Yeah. Because you don't know where it's going until you're, you're like 10 lines into the chapter when you realize you're standing around the body on the table trying to figure out what happened. And yeah. you're like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> See, for me, so I, I um, not every single chapter title is an Easter egg, but there is like um, it, for people that are, you know, some of them, it, um, they're they're going to get like where it's coming from. You know, for instance, one of my chapter titles is something wicked this way comes. Right. So if you're a Ray Bradbury fan or a Shakespeare fan, you're going to know where that comes from. If you don't know where it comes from, that's okay. The chapter title still works. But, yes. you know, so that's, um, I, I do that with a couple of um, modern uh, lines from movies and stuff like uh -huh. that. Just like here and there, you know. <laughs> yeah. and the thing is, at a point, it becomes a game with you in the there, Yeah, Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's fun to play. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, and then, you know, even in the serious stuff, sometimes there's a little, but I, I, I do use humor a lot. Um, uh, probably about 50% or 60% of my stuff has some humorous element mm -hmm. because I find it's a good counterpoint to the darker stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, um, and you can accept the darker stuff. Um, life is a joke. You either get the punchline or you are the punchline. <laughs> yeah. And that, I sort of live by that mm -hmm. because. Um, you know, if you, if you don't, if you don't laugh, you're going to cry. Yeah. I'd like to give you a quiz. So I didn't okay. mention this when we were chatting. It's, okay. a, it's about your own work. So uh, I do not I throw anyone else's work in there. It's simply <laughs> lines from some of your books. Okay. Um, and I, I just want it, it. It's just for fun to see okay. how well, you know, your work, see how well you remember your older work. Um, it's only about five, um, it's five sentences okay. or a group of sentences. And the idea is that I'll read you the line and then you tell me what book it came from. Okay. <laughs> and don't worry, this is just for fun. 
Um, I don't, I have not yet had someone get all of them right. We got close. I got close with one person where they got all of them right, except one. So, you know, it's like for the most part, everybody knows that, you know, life goes on. You write a book 20 years ago. You might not Um, remember a line. Some of them I write in a few, so I have no idea I've written them. (laughs) Sure. Yeah. (laughs) My, my camera, same thing. He knows street people, but not. Like the, and a lot of my cameras takes place in the daylight and um, they tried to open it up and make it less noirish. Yeah. But the noir stuff, the half hour noir stuff. Um, and then there's another one called Lone Wolf um, with Lewis Hayward. And it's an interesting show because the premise is uh, he's Michael Lanyard, who's the lone wolf. That's the only premise. He's a guy who does stuff. <laughs> yeah. <He shows> up, <laughs> really, sometimes they're detective shows, sometimes they're yeah. character studies, sometimes they're adventure studies or murder mysteries, or, or in, in other cases, they're not. They're just straight up stories about somebody who needs money for it. And it, it's fascinating because you, you really never know where the story's going. It's almost right. like a technology show, except it has one continuing character. Mm-hmm. That, and again, even though he will have relationships, like he'll meet someone who knew before and whatever, he is indeed the lone wolf. There's no con- no other continuing characters. Yeah. Whereas Peter Gunn, there had to have been 20 continuing characters that would show up on a regular basis. But see, I, well, like, I think I like that because you, oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's I, great. You know, seeing characters that you like <laughs> coming back. Just, we were talking before about the ouch factor. They did a, an episode where bad guys, machine gun, um, Jacoby, the, the police lieutenant. And so he's in the hospital, bandaged up. His arm is, is uh, you know, in a cast and he's laying in the bed and all this. And now I don't know if they did it because the actor had a real operation and mm-hmm. they had to justify it, or it was just them saying, let's go somewhere nobody else has gone. Sure. He's in the hospital bed for five episodes. And they build stories around that. And at one point, the girl gets shot. Edie gets shot um, when they're trying to kill Peter. And she's in, like, the next ward. And so the story's actually... Oh, yeah. And there's this tremendous sense of connectiveness with it all, you know? And I just find that, you know... And, and again, it wasn't something I was aware of as a kid. But as I've watched them in the last 10 years, and now they're, they're on one of the nostalgia channels, and I'm watching them again with this new eye, looking at the story structure and, and the depth of, you know, they went out and said, we, we want a, a weird shoeshine girl, a woman, you know, um, who uh, like runs a newsstand or something. And they found a really fascinating older woman who's a character actress and just let her loose. Nice. And, she, you know, she will have... She might only have one line in an episode and then she'll show up two or three episodes later. But that one line, again, you look at her and you know everything about her life. Yeah. You know, and, and it has so much. And I think that's a lot of what's missing now is we don't see those kind of depth in character actors in a lot of shows. Yeah, I'm trying to watch a couple and I'm, it's just like, I don't know. For one, it seems like it's the same story. They've just change the monster or whatever you know it's like every episode is the same format it's the same characters except the bad guys the bad guys are always different and that's it but you know it's like yeah and and there's a there's like a dissatisfaction a lot of times when i'm watching something and i can't always put my finger on it you know it's like oh well you know if i break it down yeah it's a good show um you know it's you know it's different here it's but but there's just something unsatisfactory I, I, about it and and I, I maybe that, that's it i think that's part of it part of it is that like, like even british shows that they bring over here now a british oh. show they conceive them I, per, <laughs> I prefer the british show <laughs> except the office the office is good <laughs> but british for the most part i i like are, british are, shows more. are built but they're built on interesting characters mm-hmm. and also, they're not built on, we have to do a billion of these and nothing ever changes. <laughs> right. Built on, we're going to do seven of them. Yes. And then if it gets renewed, <laughs> they do seven more. <clears throat> and characters are allowed to grow and change and become something else. 
I had no compunction about springing forward then and launching a Shinto blow at the base of his neck, snapping his neck at the medulla oblongata to kill him. I was not human to him. All right. I'm fairly sure that that's Dr. Shadows, and I think it might be Blood Debt, but I'm not sure. I think it might be when he's fighting the sumo. Um, oh, okay. <clears throat> um, so this is not a Dr. Shadows book. Okay. Who? See, so it's. it's but you're close. I mean, it's. It's contemporary. Well, it, it might also be. It might be John Shadows because I only use con correct terminology in contemporary stuff, not in fantasy. Okay. Uh, so, huh. All right. I was not human to him. I'm trying to think of which one that would be. I, I honestly, I can't tell you exactly. Okay. So the, I think this next, um, so I was not human to him. Um, but that meant there was one less enemy on the ship. Does that help? Uh, Wow. Well, that, that should be killing shadows. Yep. But, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, I purposely took off that last part because uh, I was like, okay. that's going to give it away, but <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. So uh, killing shadows. Yes. Ding, ding. Got one, right. <laughs> All right. It was considered by many as pseudoscience, a magical process of transmuting common substances into substances of great value. But it was much more, a source of limitless power and the very roadmap to the creation of life. As Dr. Mabon said in the, the clockwork nutcracker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> I looked up at the flaxen-haired lovely that had followed me on my gambling odyssey and recovered her name from the musty corners of my cognac besotted mind. Uh, that is from uh, Gaslight Magic. Yes, very good. <laughs> That's actually in one of the opening chapters in a uh, gambling parlor in uh, London. <laughs> very good. <laughs> Picked up the instrument and held it with the comfortable familiarity of a lover. Like, uh, he had rolls of fat everywhere on his body, but his hands were, de were, were delicate and strong fingered. Hmm. Actually, I have no freaking clue. Oh. Wow. You got me on that one. <laughs> it was from the Chronicles of Skull Mask, Revenge is Justice. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the sound of cold rain on the roof of the ambulance was a machine gun patter, rat Tat tatting from thunderous to soft and back again. Oh my God. I, I have to admit I have ghostwriters. I don't I don't know <laughs> at all. That's okay. That was from Second Sin by you sinister. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. That's you know, I, he's with the ambulance with his buddy on the way who's been okay. stabbed. Yeah. Good Lord. Well, I, okay, I'm James Madison. I admit it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if wow. I were to have a quiz, I could probably get them all right because I only have one novel out. But you have, <laughs> how many novels do you have out? Um, I think right now I have like, well, books because some of them are collections. Mm -hmm. I think I've, I've got six books out now, but I actually have nine in the queue that are turned in and waiting to come out. Oh, I've, I've written I've written 42 novels. Yeah, I was going to say there's no I I know you have more than six books. So like yeah, that's what I meant, I guess. How many yeah. novels have you written? For yeah, I've written, I've written I just finished my 43rd. So Wow. Um and uh, and yet I am not a household name unless I change my name to Exit. Uh, <laughs> then it will be up in lights everywhere. Um well, you know, the thing is is that it's funny that uh, I was talking with somebody about a week or two ago about how certain writers have certain phrases or certain mm -hmm. words that you have to watch for because you'll come back to them too often. Yes. I have, you know, like sneak quick. I blink. Those are like things. I, if I heard that in a sentence, I would know I wrote it, even if I didn't know the rest of the sentence, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> right. um, but um, I honestly, I didn't remember the, the ambulance scene until he said the book. And I went, okay, that's, He's on the ambulance on the way back. To yeah. 
Somebody who's been studying. Yeah, you just, your brain so, just needed a little jostle. <laughs> wow, wow, that's funny. But yeah, the the shooto blow. I I'm very. I, I have a background in martial arts. I was a fight choreographer for mm-hmm. four years, and uh, I could tell by the books <laughs> I read. And, yeah, and but I'm very careful um, when I'm writing stuff out not to use technical terms um, because I want people who don't know anything about it to be able to follow what's going oh, yeah. on. Mm-hmm. Um, and if it's in a fantasy setting or if the character shouldn't know the term, I can't use correct terminology. So if a shuto blow is, is the edge of the hand, mm-hmm. like a knife hand blow, I could use that with John Shadows or Dr. Shadows, and but I would use it very sparingly. And I use it with John because he's for, his story is a first person, Dr. Shadows or his third person. I could do it because it's in context, you get it. Mm-hmm. But in the same fight in one of my fantasy worlds, I would have to not use that term and find oh, yeah. a way to describe it because otherwise it pulls you out of the book. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you could use the term okay. It actually goes back to like the early 1800s. 1800s, yeah. But if you use okay in a story that takes place in the 1880s or 90s, your audience doesn't realize it's actually correct and it will pull them out. Mm-hmm. So there's, uh, there's the accurate and the perceived accurate. Yeah. And you kind of choose between the two so that you don't pull the audience out of the, the, the story. Yeah, I ran into that a couple of times with some short stories. Um, I'm involved with critters.org and um, it's, you know, writers group and critiquing group, uh-huh. critiquing. And and um, I had some people like say, um, this did not take place. This is taking place in Victorian uh-huh. era. Well, the one situation was they did not have rubbers back then. <laughs> And I was like, do your research because yes, they did. We've had safe sex for a very long time, you know? No, they would be called French letters at the time. <laughs> they had all different, you yes. know, sorts yeah. of names. But, um, you know, that it's just very interesting, the perceived, yeah. Oh, and I had okay in my, I used the word okay in my novel, yeah. but when I started to edit it, I took it out and I put all right instead because it sounded so like it didn't exactly. belong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing is that you would say England, England and America, uh, two great countries separated by common language. If you say, uh, hand me a rubber to someone in England, they give you an eraser. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, you know, you have to be fairly, you know, you have to think about it. And I have, I have a, I've written a number of things where I have English main characters. Um, and um, and I, I do a lot of accent work. So I'm, I kind of have something. Oh, very I'm, nice. Yeah, that's good. That's um, fun. Well, I, I mean, do I, too. Yeah, well, I, uh, that sort of thing is uh, I was a Scotsman for many years. I've done 60 Renaissance festivals. And, um, <laughs> and so, I, you know, I, I have to go, okay, what would – it would be a lift or it's an elevator. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, it's a lorry or it's a truck. It's, you know, and you have to go back and forth with mm. that. And then in the fantasy world, um, even there – you want to give it an old, an oldie time feel for the fantasy sure. story, but you don't want to sound like you're doing bad Ren Fair. Right. Yeah. Sure. You know, I didn't use a lot of. Yeah, I didn't yeah. use a lot of contractions in my novel, and um, but my uh, my first this novel coming out actually doesn't take place that long ago. It's basically at the turn of the century, so yeah. it's like. The it's it's happened somewhere between the 1880s and the 1920s. I don't make it super clear exactly because yeah. I wanted that wiggle room because I wanted cars and I wanted horses and carriages. So you know, well, you know, there, again, horses and carriages were still in use well up into the 30s. Oh yeah, absolutely. There were ice yeah. men still delivering ice uh, mm-hmm. from the back of wagons. In the, yeah, in it's the- a great. I love writing in that time frame because you have so much possibilities, and there wasn't TV, and there wasn't cell phones, but you you, you did you could you did have cars. Yeah, <laughs> people are still I, getting milk. I, I, in- four series that take place between 1937 and 1939. Mm-hmm. I consider that the most interesting period of the 20th century mm-hmm. because. The old world was fading. The new world was coming. They were, had recovered from the depression, sort of. Mm-hmm. And 
So you had old, you still had the old world, but you had new ideas. And it, to me, and I, I've got the Dr. Shadows, I've, the, a couple of the skull masks take th place there. Um, my Maxi Moxie, my, my adventurer, my husband and wife team take there, the, the radio reader that I'm writing. So, the, but, um, and that's part of it. You do the research and you start thinking about other stories in the same era because you oh, yeah. the research already, you know. <laughs> but it's just to me very fascinating time period. Mm -hmm. uh, there was still hope, but there was also, it was like the teenage years of, of the century. Yeah. They were, you know, they were smart enough to know better, uh, but they would still take the chance on things. <laughs> you know? So, yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> so we're going to now change gears and away from writing, which I know it, that's so hard when two writers sit down to talk about writing to change. Yeah. Because <laughs> we, we, we inevitably um, start veering back towards writing, <laughs> but <laughs> we, uh, we're, we're in our fedoras, our, <laughs> our coats, our broad shouldered coats. Um, so but for one reason, because you do write detective novels, but you are also very much into old school detective sh TV shows. Yes. <laughs> and so we talked about, um, Mike Hammer was one, and Tightrope, which I had never um, experienced. So I got to watch a couple of those episodes, and those were really fun. Um, yeah. So let's talk about that. <laughs> I, 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 I love the half-hour television format. Mm -hmm. and, and it is the equivalent of saying I like short stories as opposed to novels. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Because um, there's no time to mess around. You have to introduce your characters fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. You have to get to the point of the story and um, and you have to do it um, in a fairly exciting way. There's, you know, the, there's no long pans of the camera, you no. know, yeah. there's, and, and so there's a, there's a certain kind of a shorthand that the shows have. Um, uh, the other, the other ones I really love are T.H.E. Cat, uh, who's a, he's a bodyguard and Johnny Staccato. And Peter Gunn. Peter Gunn is like the mm -hmm. top of it, slick guy. But they're all tone poems. Mm -hmm. They're really, um, you know, they're they're done in in, in three acts. You know, a, a, a prologue, an epilogue, and, and three acts. Um, and you can't. They're a great way to study story structure for oh, yeah. stories for other things. Mm -hmm. And um, and also at that point. 50s, early 60s, um, the talent pool available to television, they were such, because they're all character actors. Even if you have a handsome yeah. lead, like Mike Connors was the lead in type rope. And, um, but all the character actors are, these are people who've honed their craft playing, you know, um, Shakespearean stuff on right, stage, on stage yeah. or hundreds of radio programs. Mm -hmm. And so you give them a simple line like, um, yeah, he's up on the third floor and they make, they make that <laughs> into an opera. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you look at that clerk at the desk saying, yeah, he's up on the third floor and you know everything about his life. Yeah. That line. <laughs> and it's just, it's, it's a great shorthand. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and um, with my camera, it was interesting because they did a pilot with Brian Keith first as my camera, which was actually done by Blake Edwards, who was the guy who did um, um, Richard Diamond. And then he, he invented, uh, he created Peter Gunn. So he really knew that format. Yeah. He went on to do the, you know, the Pink Panther movies and all that stuff. But I love Pink Panther movies. <laughs> yeah. He was a real craftsman, mm -hmm. but he, he, um, he did a pilot with Brian Keith and it didn't sell the next season. They did a, a second pilot and that pilot was with Darren McGavin, who everybody remembers now possibly from Kolchak, the night stalker, or he was the dad in Christmas story. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a, yeah, that's a range. You know, there's two seasons of it. In the first season, it was much closer to the books in that he was fairly brutal. Um, and short haired, you know, kind of a military cut and kind of curt. Mm -hmm. And McCarran didn't like that. And he started to soften the character as soon as he could. So by the second season, it was a little bit more typical detective stuff. Yeah. It wasn't quite the hardcore brutal. 
But something like Peter Gunn, first off, 90%, if not more, of the stories take place at night. They all take place in nightclubs and right. alleys. And, very noir. Yeah, very <laughs> noir. And he, the, this, the conceit of the series, and then there were two films that came after, actually. Uh, one with Craig Stevens and then one with Peter Strauss. They did a, a movie mm-hmm. 20 years later, Peter Strauss is Peter Gunn. But that he was impeccable. He was suave. He had tailored clothes. And he was this cultured guy. And he, it was the one thing that they didn't do in any of the other shows. He had a steady girlfriend from episode one. Oh, yeah. And, that, that wasn't a... And yeah, she was, they always he, wanted the lone gun, you know. Yeah, and and he was a lady every episode. <laughs> it's one of the reasons I love the show is that he... Um, uh, she sings... There's a nightclub named Mothers in the first two seasons. And in the third season, she opens her own place. But um, uh, Edie Hart... She is the torch singer and often he'll be sitting at the bar, listening to her sing and, and just smiling. And you can see that and you see the love between them. And then some clients will come in and have to go out and they they'll do some funny by play about, you know, when are you going to come back and all that yeah. stuff. But it proved you didn't have to do this, the, the fake sex element to make the story. Uh-huh. Work. Yeah. And, but it was populated by so many wonderfully eccentric weirdo characters. <laughs> you know, one of his informants is Billy Barty as this little person who's a pool hustler, um, who has like a little chair, a little uh, stand he brings around with him, gets up on and shoots pool. And, you know, that's how he makes his money. Plus he also knows stuff. Right. Um, <laughs> and weird shoe shine guys and oddball beat musicians and stuff. So it's, it's the sense of, He's our guide through this weird underworld that, but when you look at the shows in total, it's about a world with, there's a lot of cruel and dark people, but there's all these weirdos who all have love. They're all yeah. warmly connected. You know, his, his police contact is Lieutenant Jacoby, who's a obviously Jewish cop. And there was a black police sergeant through, I think he's in like 10 episodes or more and he didn't have to be at the time. You never saw a black person on television unless they were a servant. And he was a guy, an authority who didn't have to be black. Could have been anybody. Yeah. And they had to cast him as black. And that's why it worked. But that, to me, was sort of the, the pinnacle of those half hour shows. Now, Johnny Staccato was uh, a, uh, a John Cassavetes as a jazz musician turned private investigator in the, in the East village and in New York. And a lot of which were shot here. The exteriors were anyway. And, um, and again, most of them take place at night. Most of them mm-hmm. dark streets, same thing with THE cat, you know, but with a Latin touch, every, there's a lot of, of Latin, uh, Latino characters uh, in it. Um, and they were, these wonderful little tone poems where, and, and often they were sort of um, medieval, almost medieval morality plays, mm-hmm. you know, which is what the Western had become by that point. You know, yeah. the adult Westerns were all these morality plays, basically like Gunsmoke and all that. Yeah. Uh, and again, the half hour format of Gunsmoke, some of those are really dark. I mean, really yeah, dark. Yeah. Um, I, I was a little surprised. My hus- I think my husband was watching some, and uh, I was like, wow, they were, they were going there then. <laughs> was- in, in the first, I would say, four or five seasons, it was very clear what Miss Kitty's real business was upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> there was not even a doubt <laughs> right. that what went on up those stairs. <laughs> by the time they moved to the hour format, they pulled that back. And then by the time they were in color, she just owned the bar. Sure. But it was in the beginning, it was very clear <laughs> what, what her business was upstairs, um, which is why it was the first adult Western. Right. <laughs> um, you know, but, um, and again, even with that, they always hinted that they had a thing going, but they kept having relationships with Matt and other women. And they didn't have to do that at all in Peter Gunn, which proved it was not necessary. It was yeah. a very successful show and you could write caring connected characters and still have adventure stories. Mm-hmm. And to me, that, that's a, a major achievement. 
But like type rope, um, the premise of it, for those who haven't seen the show, is um, Mike Connors plays an undercover cop. It's never specified what department. Right. And it's never specified what cities he's in. It was a Midwestern city, a Southern city or whatever. Mm -hmm. At different times, he goes undercover because he's from the outside. Yeah. And he's always with the bad guys um, to infiltrate them, to, to get them. So in with his character, it is the ultimate loner. He can never yes. trust anybody. He can yeah. never make relationships. Uh, it's almost the opposite of Peter Gunn. Peter Gunn was all about relationships he had. Um, and um, so it, it was, to me, those are the two interesting contrasts of them. I worked a lot on New York soap operas and they would hire the same background actors. Um, you know, if you're going, if you, if your character, uh, your lead character likes to go to the, the Jones cafe. Well, they would hire a oh, lot of yeah. background extras for the Jones cafe over a period of years. That would make sense because if you're going to the same cafe <laughs> every day I, or every I, I week, a, you're going to see the same people. Yeah, I, I, on Guiding Light, I worked as a cop. I, I think I paid my rent for about eight years from Guiding Light. Um, and sometimes I had major lines. Sometimes I had one line and sometimes I was just background. It would rotate. Mm -hmm. But there was an entire like station house of us. We only saw each other on the set. <laughs> but over the course of, you know, four or five years, we were the station cops. And it was clear we were the yeah. station cops. <laughs> and, and there was one running joke on Guiding Light. Um, two, they did it two years in a row and they were going to do it the third and then somebody got sick, but there was, it was a background joke. It was literally, they hired me as a Santa Claus and this other guy, Tony, who was like five, three in an elf outfit. <laughs> and we would be bringing a perpetrator in. <laughs> uh, the main characters were doing something. We're bringing the guy in and tussling one in the background. We did that two years in a row. Oh. And it was like a running gag that no. you know, we were the cops. <laughs> Who did this like street <laughs> Santa thing? Yeah. You know that it was guys in the writers' room just having fun. Yeah, but but it you know but that kind of community was reflected in very few programs. You know because yeah. often they were made because they were made assembly line. They were made out of sequence, and so they didn't yeah. connect. And but you know again, it, it gives texture to the background of the world. Mm -hmm. The more texture you can give. Yeah. the more reality it builds for your reader and yes. the viewer, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah so that. <laughs> um, how about you um, promo your book of choice? Yeah. Oh, tell us a little I, bit I will, about it. I will, I will do John shadows, killing shadows, which is out from airship 27. Um, that's John on the cover. Um, and uh, it, uh, it is very noir. I call it martial arts noir, but oh, no. an old flame of his comes back into his life and asks for his help. She wants him to help her serve divorce papers on her crazed megalomaniac millionaire husband. And, uh, and then lots of bad stuff happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it ends up being uh, something of a globe trotting adventure. He ends up in, in Stuttgart, Germany um, and in Japan pursuing the bad guys. Um, but it starts in, starts in Weehawken, New Jersey <laughs> um, and goes to upstate New York and um, everywhere in the book I have been. So oh, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I try to build again. I try to build that, that level of reality into it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, and the, the next book, Deadly Shadows, will be coming out, I, I think, before the end of 2021. Oh, uh, very nice. Oh, so close. This one, yeah, this one's out now. Uh, it came out in, I think, March um, or April. And uh, it's available at Amazon.com yep. or at Airship 27. Uh, okay. Which is yeah, great. So, and that was what I was going to ask you is do you prefer people to go to Amazon or do you prefer people to go to another site that benefits uh, you or the publisher more? Uh, I think actually you go to either. I think whether you go to their site or Amazon, uh, it, it works out fine. Um, okay. I don't have it set up to sell directly myself yet mm -hmm. from my website, which is the <laughs> urban swashbuckler 
swashbuckler.com. The urban swashbuckler.com. Very nice. <laughs> and, really fun. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. And um, are you work? What are you working on right now? Um, I'm actually working on Radio Rita and the, the Pearl of Shanghai, which is for a collection mm-hmm. for Airship 21, uh, Airship 27, rather. Um, uh, the premise being she is a, uh, an adventurer in the 1930s. Uh, it's it actually, it's a very fascinating thing. They have a logo character who's this, uh, just, a, a woman with a, uh, a, a leather flying cap on, they found as a cartoon and, uh, they used it as a logo cause it's their, their, their logo is an airship, which is, you know, old dirigible. Mm-hmm. And somebody said, well, who's that? He said, oh, it's just a drawing. Well, you got to give her a name. So they named her Rita. Oh, okay. And, and, uh, and then people kept going, well, when are you going to give us? Stories of Radio Rita, you know. Oh, very nice. <laughs> and, and they went, you know what? Yeah. So they gave me and the other three authors, each, there's four of us, they gave us her physical description and the fact that she must be a pilot. That's it. That's it. Oh, how and fun. Can write in any time period, any style. And mine is an adventurous in Shanghai the day World War II starts. Oh, wow. Um, August, August 12th, 1937. Um, but, and I have no idea what the other three are writing. And I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, it's, it's going to be just as exciting as you can imagine for me to see what they do. Yeah. They, they could do it futuristic. They could make her a radio host. Could be anything. But, what'll, yeah, what will be interesting to see what the differences are, but also if you guys, if, if there's some similarities, that'll be really interesting to see. Yeah, well, I said, it's the, it, we have an image, you know, it's this woman yeah. with a flying cap on and a radio and, you know, old time microphone and that she's, you know, redhead, green, green eyes. And that's it. I, and we're like, wow. And I'm <laughs> like, that's the kind of assignment I like where I literally can do anything. Yeah. And Santa, I'm I'm dying to see what the the other three writers are really good writers. When I when I finish that, I'm back on to my next Altiva fantasy novel, which the the first one of those Dragon Throat should come out later this year. Oh, um, very exciting. Okay. Yeah. So when will that uh, Radio Rita what, about when Actually, should we expect? I, I, I don't know. It depends on when the others turn there is, but I'm sure um, the publisher's really hyped on it. I'm thinking probably October November of this year. Oh, okay. be, uh, there's yeah. a very fair, a fairly quick turnaround. One of the uh, airship 27, uh, if I may, um, <laughs> airship, now airship 27. One of their things is, and of course now I can't find any of them. Here we go. Is they do illustrations. They have 10 illustrations. Oh, fun. Yeah. And um, so often it's a case of the book is turned in and they wait for the illustrator to be available. Oh Yeah. Uh, Chris Nye, who was doing the illustrations for my Dragon Throat novel, is just knocking it out of the park. And I'm an, I'm an artist, so I know what my characters look like. Mm-hmm. And he's just, the energy of it is great. So it, great. it really enhances the books. Mm-hmm. But it sometimes is the bottleneck waiting for that, that the illustrations to get done. Yeah. But I have a feeling they they like Radio Rita so much. I have a feeling it'll kind of move to the front of the pack, uh, <laughs> and yeah. uh, it'll be out fairly quickly. So it's exciting because it's like I said it's it's literally the day before. I had no idea I was ever going to write that thing. Then I h- heard them talk about this, and I went, you know, I want to do that. So yeah. the next day I was on Radio Rita. <laughs> yeah, you got your gears going. <laughs> yes, exactly. Dream, yeah. <laughs> These days, I'll take any inspiration I can get from any source. Sure. You know? <laughs> Some of these days, been last year has been pretty tough. I I call my apartment the word cave, but sometimes it's nice to come out of the cave. And yes. <laughs> year, I've been yeah. in the cave an awful lot. You know? Well, that's great. Thank you so much. I've had a great time chatting with you. And I'm looking forward. What is the publisher for your book? Oh yes. Um. Oh, of course. White Cat Publications. Ooh, yeah, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Very cool. I look forward to seeing that. That's coming out, you say, in end of September? Um, it's actually the, it'll come out on Kindle this month. Um, I think, oh. I think audiobook will be next month and then paperback in October. So, you know, we, we, we were going to release it all around the same time, but he decided to, all, all around October, but he decided to push up the Kindle version. Awesome. Yeah. So it's awesome. very exciting. Yeah. I very much look forward to that. 
thank you very much. <laughs> it's been a delight meeting with you and, and getting to chat. Yes, you too. Hey, if you like this conversation and the stuff we talk about, hit like and subscribe to Jude's channel. Get it going.